those pieces is, is absolutely medication management. And, you know, I think medication can help mitigate some of some of those like severe symptoms that we're seeing. And, and, and sometimes folks, you know, with schizophrenia may never get rid of their voices, no matter how many medications that they take. And so that's where, you know, CBT comes into play. That's where DBT, you know, all of these different treatment approaches that we have become supportive to our clients because people with severe mental illness may never get rid of all of their symptoms. And medication support absolutely can, can can be supportive. And and what I'm passionate about and what I continue to be passionate about is this community piece because I you know I think community is such an important part of our own healing as humans. It is such a big factor with people with severe persistent men- mental illness to feel like they are part of a community and to not be stigmatized or ostracized and to feel like they have a place and a place where they belong and a place where they're contributing and, and being loved and, and can use their strengths. So, so for people that might uh, listen to a little bit of this and be a little bit confused, uh, can you, can you two talk about the Colorado recovery model just a little bit? Because it is fascinating. Your guys' main goal is to get people back into the community and destigmatize in a sense. Yes. Totally. Absolutely. Yeah. So a lot of folks that, that we see are, are coming from usually from like a inpatient hospitalization and then like traditionally the move towards um, our residential facility where they have 24 hour seven staff, um, but they're also asked to contribute to the household where they're, you know, cooking with a staff member and basically being, you know, trained to feel like a human, right? Just a normal person. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they've got, you know, they've got some support and, and they're allowed to, to leave on pass and, and meet with friends and, and they still have this like really structured environment. And, and once they're ready, if it feels appropriate, they'll move to our, our uh, transitional services where they have therapeutic roommates and some, a little bit of oversight, you know, by our transitional housing program manager who sort of helps support, you know, folks with, with what they might need in regards to, to housing or, or even life skills development. And we have a life skills counselor. And so after, after that, like our, our our ultimate goal is, you know, folks are going to move either into independent living or in a therapeutic housemate situation where they're getting support, you know, via like a a therapeutic housemate or they're able to do it on their own. And so, as they move through our system, they're gaining the skills to essentially like live independently or semi-independently. And that's the ultimate goal, to get these people comfortable to be on their own, if they're able. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. And I think the great thing about Colorado Recovery is we're, we're looking at a, a population of, of humans that are very different on the spectrum of like some folks may never live on their own and may need the support of a therapeutic roommate their entire life. And some folks just need our support and may go back to, to their wife or their husband. Some may go back to living independently. It really, it is so individualized and the spectrum of the humans that we support is, is so different. And our ultimate goal is, is really to support clients in their own autonomy and, and getting back to their most meaningful life. And, and that may look very different for each person. That's a, that, that's a very interesting thought that, that you guys tailor an end result based on what their best life can be. That, that's a, that's a neat little thought. Uh, how many people are in, how many uh, clients does Colorado recovery have approximately at any given time? Yeah. So <laughs> that's interesting based on recent COVID. <laughs> COVID. Um, so our our house, the inpatient facility that we have, so that's mostly folks transitioning from um, or needing a higher level of care. We can support about eight people. And, and that looks a little bit different based on how COVID is kind of happening. <laughs> uh, and then we, I, I, you know, I think at transitional, we can support about eight clients at a time. And then outpatient, there's no, there's no capacity. Um, we have, I think about 
you know, between like 70 and 80 clients total right now. And most of our outpatient clients live within Boulder County and uh, receive our services like, you know, <clears throat> either they see a doctor and a therapist regularly or join some of our therapeutic groups. So so COVID has, has put a, pr- a more of a strain on people's mental health, I assume. I mean, <laughs> I, I think that's kind of like the normal, I think it's put a strain on all of our mental health. I know it's impacted me. I know it's impacted my community of humans. And so I imagine people who also have, <laughs> have struggles with, you know, like persistent mental illness, it's, it absolutely has impacted them. It's, it's a really isolating world we're living in right now. And, and we're having to do these interactions over a screen. And, and though I am grateful for this screen to offer us some sort of connection, it is not the human connection that we need as humans. Yeah, it's been really strange. I know uh, I take my two kids out hiking at least once a week. We go somewhere and the reactions uh, of people that we pass on the trail vary. You've got some people that don't care that their, you know, my little three-year-old has zero sense of personal space. So he'll run right up to anybody and uh, he'll just want to talk to him, give him a high five. Uh, Some people love it. They don't care. Uh, But I've ran into a couple people that I've never seen genuine fear until that time. Uh, you can just see it right on their face. Like if, if this kid doesn't get away from me, I'm going to jump <laughs> off the side of this trail. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's really shocked me. I don't, uh, I'm not used to that. That, that, that that's not something that's normal for me. Mm. Yeah. And Zach, and, and like, that just makes me think of like how people react to people that they see in the community that are, that are mentally ill and that have these, <laughs> these symptoms that are scary, right? It's like, oh, someone's talking to themselves. That's really scary. I'm going to jump to the side of the road because this this person looks really scary to me. So when, when you're dealing with this this population of, of people that have some of these mental illness disorders, what are, what are the misconceptions? Uh, we'll just take someone that's maybe, uh, I don't know, schizophrenic, for example. You know, um, I, I think the the common thing is that like you said, most people are scared of someone like that. Is is it is an illness like that on a spectrum? Do do people suffer differently? And how are they viewed in the community? I definitely think it's on a spectrum. And it's you know, it, it's not black or white. And you know, whether they have schizophrenia or not, I think anyone that has a mental illness is stigmatized in in our society, unfortunately. You know, I think people have an idea that people with, you know, schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder are, are crazy. You know, I'll just use that term. Violent. Violent. Um, you know, that you should be scared to, to be in the same room with them. And that has definitely not been my experience um, working with clients with serious mental illness. So really it's just about keeping an open mind and just making sure you treat them just, just like a, a person. Yes. Yes, that totally. So out of, out of this group of of people that are in the assisted living facilities in the outpatient programs, uh how how do you two uh decide who is um I guess eligible or should go on your uh, nature wilderness therapy programs? Is it open enrollment? Can anybody go? Uh- um, I, you know, I would say that like, no, it, it's not necessarily open enrollment. A client needs to be stable. And so, and, and when I say stable, I mean, they're not a danger to themselves or to others. Um, we ask that they're committed to their recovery program. And, and, and yeah, though, you know, though we do some different types of programs that are, have different physical challenges, we ask that they are able to meet those, you know, what, whatever those challenge that challenges that may be in, in the setting that we're going. We really don't want to leave anyone out. We've tailored our trips so that, you know, we have, um, we have a hut trip that we'll do. That's just a couple miles in. We did a, like a cabin trip, so to say that was really accessible to anyone, even if they had no experience hiking. So we really want our wilderness therapy program to be inclusive because we don't want people, especially our population to feel like 
they're not accepted. So uh, for for the program, kind of walk me through a, a trip. What's what's it look like? When does it start? Which one do you want to hear about? <laughs> well, how many do you have? That's a good question. <laughs> We, we do about five, well, since COVID, we have done only day, like day long trips. So um, our, our wilderness program is, is quite new. And we, we had planned this year to do about five programs. And that is not happening <laughs> based on COVID. And we're hoping that we can, we can renew, you know, or restart soon. But I would say, so our first program was Don, where was it? The Wigwong Trail? Yeah. So our typically our programs are going to be two, two nights, three days long. That's like typically the length of time that we'll go for. And then, like I said before, we'll do a backpacking trip. And that's the one that Katie and I, um, we really love doing backpacking trips. I mean, we love all the trips and each trip is like really special and unique, but I think both of us really feel more connected to the backpacking trips because of the fact that you're hiking out and you're in the middle of the woods and, you know, help is a little bit further away. Um, It just feels a little more special for us. So to kind of talk about what that looks like is we do a lot of planning. There's a lot of planning that goes into planning our trips. I wish I had the outline that I've created (laughs) for the planning that goes into it. Um, A lot of the planning really is, is is prepping our clients for the experience and and making sure that we can create a safe experience for them. And, And so it may look like we're, you know, we're doing one, meeting prior to the trip based on like, Hey, like these are the leave no trace principles. And this is what's important for us to, to step into as we, as we go into the back country and, and how we're going to interact with the environment, how we're going to interact with each other. And then, uh, you know, another really big piece is okay. Like we've got to talk about gear. You know, we've got a lot of the gear for you all and you're responsible for your own personal gear, including clothing. And, and so we're looking at clothing that people have and making sure that they're, you know, they've got enough warm layers and layers that are going to keep them safe if we get rained on. And with our folks, you know, organization can be, can be tough sometimes. So we're really having to like work individually with people and, and making sure that they have the the proper gear. And that may be, that may mean going to REI with them and, and, creating a budget and, and, and figuring out what they need and, and picking out clothing with them. And then, you know, maybe our third meeting is talking about food and, Hey, this is what we're going to actually like address therapeutically during this and, and sort of getting folks in the right frame of mind of, of wanting to approach some of these topics or being in the space to approach some of the topics that we want to bring up during these trips. Uh, do you, do you have any kind of uh, recommended readings or like a, a thought checklist that maybe you give them before you go out? No, but that would be a cool idea. <laughs> we give them a we give them a gear list before they go out. <laughs> yeah. They get a gear list and they get an itinerary. That's and that's that's one of the things that the Huts for Vets organization did. I know completely different type of mental trauma, but um he said the really important thing for them was to uh, get this prerequisite reading down, get into the mind space of trying to focus in on some of your problems mm-hmm. and, and the readings they suggested help get mm-hmm. you there. I think I, I really like that idea because as we said, like this program is very new. We've really only ran four trips, I think at this point and COVID has really set us back. So we're always looking for like new ideas so that we can improve this program. Um, And I know a lot of times our clients are just so excited to like get out and get outside that really we're focusing on like having fun and connecting with one another. And sometimes our agenda has to go out the door. We will literally plan like three days worth of this is what we're going to do. And then the clients are like, no, I'm just going to go like roll around in the snow for a while. So it's tricky. Well, well I, th- I think with with the population of people that you guys are helping, 
I, I think that goes back to your original principle of just allowing them to feel like 